portion of your music is written about relationships, past or current. How do you navigate writing songs about exes without hurting the feelings of your current partner? What a great I, I wanna, question. I, I think it's a fascinating question, but I, wanna, I want Vivek to start. You go first. <laughs> no, no, please. No, please, you. I insist. <laughs> I'll go. Um, uh, it's tough to navigate that. That's a really, actually, I'm very excited by your question because it's a, something I've been thinking a lot about for the last couple of years because I think as a young person, I did not think about it. Um, I try to only tell my story now, my side. I should be, and I, I apply that to everything. I always just try to say it's my side of the story. And that includes Sarah, like even just talk, like I feel like it's so easy, we fall into talking for each other and then it, it's, it spreads and I talk for other people. And I think in some of my early work, not just the actual music, but the, the, the marketing and the talking about the music, I was telling the, like both sides or, or implying or speaking for uh, another person and I think that was bad and I feel really bad about that. Um, I think in the last couple records I've gotten better at only telling my side, my perspective, and I've also gotten less, um, I'm less inclined to victimize myself, which I think is easy to do when you're the only one with the mic. You get this opportunity to write your side and it's really easy to cast yourself as the victim, or and which is wild since I was always, not I wasn't bad, but I just, I, you know, I don't know why I felt so bad for myself, um, to be honest. but. Uh, uh, so I think that when I'm writing about past relationships or I'm talking about it in public now, I try to be really respectful of that and try to speak, you know, very much of my own experience. And um, especially of late, I like to tie it back to what's wrong with me so that it's about me and it's not someone going, wow, that terrible thing happened to Tegan, that person that she was with must have been terrible. It's like, I really believe that I'm, I, I have responsibility in that. So I, I just try to act more cautiously around, around that. But it's really hard also when you're in a relationship and you're really happy to write sad songs because they immediately think it's about them. And then when you eventually break up, they're like, I knew it. But <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. I think uh, for me, I just pull from experiences and that emotion inspires me. So it's, I can write really miserable songs while I'm still really happy. So it's, it's complicated because you're not just navigating how you're talking about your exes, you're actually navigating how you're talking to your partner who's alive and well, right next to you, and you're like, I spent the last 12 hours working on this song, are you ready? And it's like, so sad and upsetting, and they're like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sarah, do you feel, I'm of two minds, I, here we go. In the past, <laughs> most of the girls that I've had relationships with were fine with being part of my story and, and the songs that I wrote, and in most cases are still friends of mine. And I guess on the other side of it, there are people who should feel very lucky that I'm not crueler and more candid. <laughs> well put. <laughs> like basically I'm saying if they had a problem with it, like don't push me. Because there's plenty more where that came from. Do you really want me to answer this? Yeah, I do. I mean, very curious. Oh, well, I mean, for me, the harder thing is the existing relationship. So I tend to pull a lot from my past. So kind of what you were saying, Tegan, where like, it's like I wrote an entire novel about my ex and then I handed it to my current partner, not telling them what I had spent like months and months writing about. <laughs> and then he read it and he was like, oh. <laughs> So yeah, I find that harder to do from, is like pull from the past while you're in an existing relationship. I have a question for you, jumping off of your question, which I also want to answer publicly to work through emotionally, but how about when exes, not even exes, I just have people who I didn't even have a relationship with, but we got close, who have created a narrative that the music's about them. Oh, Most of my songs crazy. have been inspired by maybe like well, maybe like three or four people, but like pretty much anyone I've ever dated is like, oh, well, I dated her during this period, so that record's about me, and I'm like, nah, is not even close. Is this because I I thought Call It Off was about me? <laughs> <laughs> no, but but this is interesting to me. 
me too, because I feel sometimes on the other side of things, like where I'm trying to be really sensitive and, and trying to be really responsible with the people I cared about, even the ones that were terrible, there was something about them I liked, obviously. And <laughs> I'm trying to be respectful, but the other side of it is like, how do, I don't sign at the bottom of the song lyrics and say like, this song is about you. Like, I, you know, I don't tell people, I'm not like, by the way, I'm, I wrote a song about you. Like, I would never do that. I would never do that. And they're out there telling people, so how do you deal with that? Again, please, you go ahead. <laughs> that doesn't happen to me. You don't think people are like, oh, that record's definitely about me. What? They're having cocktails around a table with a bunch of people who are like, yeah, you know, Sarah was all hung up on me and she wrote that song about me. And... I mean, I think the people who I wrote the songs about know it and anyone else <laughs> who says, I feel sort of actually kind of bad for them in a weird way, because the people who know, the people know <laughs> who the songs are for. And anyone in between, I'm just like, if that's what you need to get through it, please take a whole record. Any of my early work, please. <laughs> take all of Under Feet Like Yours. All of Under Feet Like Yours. All yours. There you go, run with it. I made a project a couple years ago that you're in called What I Love About Being Queer, and I started hearing in the community, so I asked like 34 people what they love about being queer, and I started hearing in the Toronto queer community that people were like, she only asked people that were pretty, or people started saying that I asked they them. They think I'm pretty? Yes. That's, that's, and other people were like, oh, she totally asked me, but I said no, and I was like, I never fucking asked you. <laughs> so I just like made me very angry. Sure. But, yeah. Interesting. By the way, I mean, these are just things that I think you have to accept about having public work is that authorship is something that is really complicated and you know I, I think about this a lot about what is an idea who owns an idea and a relationship is really similar it can feel really touchy for someone I actually think that for the people I've written songs about it's like they're relieved in a way because they're part of the history whereas to be left out. Part of the history. Yeah. No, but I mean that. So, I mean that so. I, think, I mean. I mean that seriously. Like, I've dated musicians. Like, it's it's a thing. Like, you don't want them to not write a song about you, even if they're the worst. You're like, okay. I'm gonna actually. I'm gonna disagree because one time I dated someone did not know that they were a musician. And it's not the same. Oh, as what I'm talking about. Wait, I know. Someone wrote a rap song about you. Too. No, 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 no. <laughs> I dated a musician, but I didn't know they were one. They That's kept not the same. Just let me get the sentence out. I dated a mime, and they never did their routine. For me. It was confusing. My point was going to be that I dated a musician, didn't know they were a musician, but when it came up, finally, I was like, cool, but really nervous, obviously, because Matt, like, you know, we get why I'm nervous, right? Like, it's like, you're like someone, you're really into them, and then they're like, actually, I also um, do music. And I was like, oh my god, amazing. But also, I was like, is this the Star is Born story? <laughs> no, this is that, then you said when you date a musician you want them to write a song about you and I'm basically saying that usually I'm dating a musician whose music I've already heard, like, and attracting But then when them. you find out someone's a musician, I mean, imagine they're just wildly talented and you didn't know that whole time, and then it's the opposite. So it is a Star is Born. It's, I don't know, I don't know that. Is. <laughs> oh, okay. Not okay, no, this was just whatever. Fuck you guys. <laughs> It was bad, and I was like, this is horrifying. It took me two months to listen to it, because I listened to it three seconds at a time. Not a fucking lie. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Hello, my Hi. name is Shelby. Hi, Shelby. I was uh, born and raised in Edmonton and spent probably nine years out in a little town. And when I say little, I mean population 400, and the K-12 school was 500. Little town and little towns come with small minds. What would you have wanted from your peers as a, as a youth, as a young adult, in your own time of confusion to make you feel a little bit more comfortable around the people around you that you don't seem to be the same as? What can we do as individuals to help our neighbors be more comfortable in their own skin? Well, I think, you know, I mean, great question. Our, our specific story is really I think unique in the sense that we actually did have quite an open-minded community and like Tegan said earlier, I think a lot of what prevented us from talking about our sexuality it was, I mean, was embarrassment, but also for me, I mean, there was, there was real, like, fear. But I think speaking in the present, you know, we've touched on a few things like the GSAs, for example. I mean, these are places, these are, these are people who can uh, become sort of community pillars for people who might see themselves as other. And I, 
you know, when I think about a small town and I think about what it would mean for, you know, if you were, if you were one of, you know, 400 or 500 people to know that you were different, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to say. I mean, I've only lived in places with a million plus people. It's, I don't know if being out in a community of 400 people is the safest thing always or is the most comfortable thing. I can only say that, you know, when people, when people make themselves visible, you usually find other people who, who need to be visible with you or need support with you. And, um, and I think that, you know, we put a lot of stuff on, on kids. Um, we, put, we put a lot of stuff on kids uh, that, is, um, that is too heavy for them to bear, but I think identity is something that we can allow them the space to figure out on their own up until a certain point. And I go back to the GSA thing. I don't know if they're specifically talking about LGBTQ issues, but when we're talking about these G GSAs, they do provide a little bit of privacy from the adult and outside world. And I do think that they allow kids to come out or discover things about their identities at their own pace instead of it having to be like a big to-do. A lot of the kids at the GSAs that we met, I don't even know how they identify. They just want to hang out with people who feel comfortable hanging out in a room that's for the Gay Straight Alliance. And I and I think that those are the kinds of places, and those are the community spaces that we need to to build and let the kids build them and, and make them the way that they need to be. Thank you very much. Do we have GSA people here? I always, every time we say GSA, it's like the magic word, like it's like, whoo. <laughs> well, we also talk about, um, we talk a lot about, like, with our foundation about representation and, you know, not, we're certainly not the ones that came up with it, but we hear it a lot in the activist social justice world, but you can't be it if you can't see it. And I think that we've talked a lot about this tonight in different ways. You're talking about seeing the posters up at the university, whether you walk in the room or not, seeing that those groups exist, knowing that other people like you exist is massive. For Sarah and I, it was very far and few between, but they're almost identical. The times when we were young, when we saw representation of LGBTQ people, whether it was in books or television or in the world. When my mom told us that Katie Lang was gay and brought home the Vanity Fair or whatever, was it Vogue or Vanity Fair, or like where she's getting um, shaved by Cindy Crawford? Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair? That was huge. And I think that we just have to see more uh, of ourselves in the community. And I, th I think Sarah's right, especially for young people, it's a big burden to have to like, come out or to talk about identity or to you know, articulate and find your language, but just knowing and seeing other LGBTQ people are out there is really massive. It's really, you know, I think a big part of that. So I just wanted to add that on the end. I think we're done now. Yeah, well on sure. that note, again, thank you so much for being someone for us to see, for being so visible, for being so Thank outspoken. you for being so incredible, making so much amazing art and being so positive and wonderful. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Making this about you. Sorry. <laughs> But we're proud of you. <laughs> I love you so much. Thank you so much for everything and a round of applause for Tegan and Sarah. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to get you two off to the VIP area um, over near the gray area. And Vivek, I believe you're going to be doing book signings at the back of the room. Um, merchandise will be sold once again. So once again, huge round of applause. Wow, thank you.